Okay, we'll give everyone a little bit of a chance. Uh, I'm going to look for Laura in the back just so I know that we're on the right time. Okay. So this is really cool. This is like such a treat for me and the entire bank director team to be able to welcome everyone uh, to the NASDAQ market site today. I think I've met some of you. I'm not sure that I've met everyone. I'm Al Dominic. I'm the president of Bank Director, and uh, Declan Denahan is with me from BNY Mellon. And we're going to just, I think, get into a pretty interesting conversation over the next 45 minutes to an hour. Now, I asked Laura what time it was because this is going to be a live streamed event. So if there's questions throughout, if you wouldn't mind just you know, raising your hand, we have a microphone. Uh, and if you just identify your name and the company you're with, that would be helpful for anyone who's watching online. Uh, you know, thinking about a program like this, it just doesn't happen. We've had a, a team that's been thinking about growth and innovation in the banking market for a number of years. And I, I'm looking at our chairman, Bill King. Three years ago, we were here when we relaunched the Bank Director brand. And it's really been a wonderful partnership with NASDAQ over the years. Um, they asked if I would just say a few, a few words as I try to run the PowerPoint, uh, about what NASDAQ's been up to. NASDAQ in the early 90s was one of the first companies to take an interest in what Bank Director had to offer to the financial sector. And over the last 23 years has been a great business partner of ours. If you look at the exchange, they're most known for technology companies. But I don't know that you'd realize that a number of financial organizations are listed on the NASDAQ. I think it's the second most represented market group uh, today. So when we're here, there's a natural connection because bank director's focus is in large part NASDAQ's focus. And so again, we really appreciate them offering up their space in their facilities. As I mentioned, I'm Al Dominic. Uh, I've been with bank director several times in my career, but I've been with this team for the last four years. And it was really a, a great opportunity to invite Declan to join us because his perspective is you know, one that I think really lines up with a number of people in the audience today. And I say that because as a company, we're focused on the informational needs of CEOs, CFOs, general counsel, chairmen, and outside directors of financial institutions across the country. And these are little banks, and these are really the biggest banks. And everyone has issues. But if you think over the last five years about how we've come out of some pretty tough times, I don't think it would be surprising to hear that most board members are asking, well, OK, well, what's next? Like, what can I do? How do I position myself? Um, really, how do I elevate certain conversations so that we can make smart, strategic decisions? So Bank Director, uh, I was joking with Declan, is something of an Irish company because I think we do things in threes pretty well. We do things online, in print, and in person. So in front of everyone here uh, at the market site, you'll see a welcome uh, you know, box that includes the current issues of Bank Director magazine, a little bit of information on the digital offerings that we have, the research we conduct. And I'm going to touch on that as we get into our Q&A uh, today. But again, if you're not familiar with Bank Director, bankdirector.com is probably the easiest place for you to find out about who we are. Um, earlier this spring, we were talking with a number of bank CEOs and chairmen in New Orleans at our annual growth conference. And this growth conference is really an extension of a big M&A event that we have every year in Arizona. And what we've found is a number of banks have an interest in growing, but not through acquisition, or they're not in a position to sell their bank. So they've come to us and said, we're in this kind of interesting position where we know we need to grow, but we're really not sure how to. And we don't want you to tell us how to grow. We just want some ideas and inspiration. And so we started this growth conference a few years ago just to provide some conversation points and conversation starters, again, at the board level, that would help people understand what's available to them. And I really like this quote from Charles Darwin talking about, you know, it's not the strongest of the, the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but it's the ones most responsive to change. And I think that's going to be one of the themes that we carry out uh, through this, you know, Q&A. We couldn't have an event like this if there wasn't an interest. And typically, bank director is quick to open the doors for bank executives and board members. Today, we decided to flip that uh, script around. And so you can see a number of the titles and uh, logos of the companies that are joining us here in New York today. We really appreciate your participation. Um, again, if there's questions that come up, we're certainly happy to field them during this presentation. But we'll have time afterwards if you want to catch anyone one on one. We also think there's some real value in just networking with your peers. Obviously, you've all made a commitment to the financial sector, 
and with our publishers, you know, driving force uh, behind this, we've tried to select companies that we think are doing some really interesting things in support of banks today. So this is not an entirely random collection of uh, companies that are with us. We really think that there's some great stories that are being told in the audience. So that's a little bit of context about who we are and why we're doing this, but I think we want to get into the BNY Mellon story. It's the oldest bank in the US. If I understand this correctly, Alexander Hamilton has something to do with the founding of the Bank of New York. That is correct, Al, 230 years old. So um, been around a little while, gone through a couple of different business cycles at this stage. Um, currently, our business is really focused in two areas. Um, as an investment manager, we're one of the 10 largest investment managers globally. That business is focused on uh, institutional investment management and wealth management. And then on the investment servicing side, we are the world's largest investment servicer with approximately $27 trillion worth of assets under administration. So as a reference point, that's somewhere around 20% of the world's investable assets. So they're the two things that we do in a really significant way. The way we've positioned the firm is that we, we position ourselves as the investments company for the world. So anything that our clients want to do, and our clients are primarily uh, banks, broker dealers, and advisors. Uh, corporates, uh, sorry, the second segment would be investment managers. Uh, the third area would be insurance companies. And then the fourth area would be corporate, not-for-profit, and government. Anything that that client set wants to do about creating assets, managing assets, administering assets, restructuring assets, that's what we're there to help them solve for. Um, and this just gives you a quick uh, one-page view of the firm. Uh, like I said, about $29 trillion under administration, $1.6, $1.7 under management. And our investment management structure, we, we run in a, a multi-boutique model. So even though we're one of the 10 largest investment managers in the world, there's actually a series of brand names that were recognized, that will maybe more recognizable to you than the pure BNY Mellon investment management. That's enough about BNY Mellon. Let's get into the conversation. I think we should. You know, over the last few years, it's become pretty clear that the banking world is no longer a big versus small arena. It's really one of who can be the smartest and the fastest to look at new opportunities. And as Declan and I you know, just talked a little bit about how we wanted to kick things off, I asked him about innovation and how he would define it. Because if you think about being creative, it's something that everyone aspires to. But then how do you monetize that creativity? And so for me, I think of innovation in those maybe financial terms. And I wanted you just to start by talking a little bit about your team. And when you walk in the door on a Monday morning, how they think about innovation. So um, when we first uh, started this journey on innovation, we had a lot of conversation about what is innovation, what does innovation mean? And um, where we sort of settled is that um, for us, it's the processes, it's how we evolve the processes, the profit formulas, and the culture of the company so that we can continue to remain relevant and so that we can deliver value for our clients, for our shareholders, and for our employees. So it's not one single thing. It's an ongoing process. You talked about an innovation journey at BNY Mellon. I, I thought this was kind of an interesting point to start and introduce early. Yep. Yeah, so um, obviously, the bank's been around for 230 years. Um, our founder, Alexander Hamilton, was somewhat of a visionary. So there's been a long history of innovation within the firm. But we're also a, um, a very large conservative firm. Um, personally, I started the innovation journey with the bank in 2009, I'd been running a business previously in, in one of the uh, operating uh, divisions. And Karen Peets, who at the time was the uh, running six business units, a, a group we called Financial Markets and Treasury Services, she wanted to start a more formal program to look at um, how you could enhance the process, the pace, and the culture of innovation uh, across a large organization. So. Uh, I was fortunate to be given an opportunity to work on that and had somewhat of a blank slate to, to start from. So this wasn't my background, didn't quite know where to start with it. So I started by going around the different business units and speaking a lot to the business units about what innovation meant to them, uh, how they 
how they innovated, how they listened to their clients, how they built uh, products or services. And um, after doing a lot of listening, a lot of listening, um, the opinions people have on what, mean, what innovation means are very diverse, um, we decided to start a program. And what we realized at the very beginning was for a company like ours, a large company like ours, there were, there were a couple of things that we knew were going to be true. Um, the first was that it was absolutely imperative that the effort be clearly seen to have senior level executive leadership. Um, without that, you weren't going to get the voice in the company. Um, we were fortunate we had that. The second thing we knew was that we weren't going to get it right the first time, that this was not going to be a single thing that we would do, mark, done, and move on. We knew it was going to be an evolutionary process that we would keep on building on. So the first iteration, what we did was we, we started off uh, pretty simply, actually, really um, developing a platform that allowed for uh, the 10,000 employees that were in those six businesses uh, to have a forum where they could uh, formulate ideas, submit ideas, and have a formal review process. It was a way to sort of catch the ideas and push them through a funnel so that they could actually get some, some attention. Um, to encourage that behavior, we did two other critical things. Um, first thing was rewards, um, always motivate behavior. So we created a, a, a minor awards program to try and encourage that behavior. Um, and then the second thing, which was really important, was we established targets on a business unit level. So it wasn't something that was just going to be out there in the ether and, yeah, go get some good ideas. Uh, but we actually formalized targets for each of the business units. And that began to give the program a, a wee bit of bite. Um, so we then launched out with that, wanted to see what would happen. And in the first iteration, it was, it was really interesting what we learned. So firstly, there was a significant pent-up desire from our employee base, from the 10,000 employees, to get their voices heard. Right? They, want, they had ideas. They wanted to get them out there. The second thing we learned was that that old saw about there's no such thing as a bad idea is not true. <laughs> OK? It's, it's absolutely not true. There were some really good ideas. Uh, there was a lot of what I would call sort of high volume, low value ideas. And then there was a subset of the employee base that were basically confused about it because this was new. They hadn't had this opportunity before. So they sort of viewed it, they viewed it as the electronic version of the old employee suggestion box. So anything that they wanted, like, you know, we should have Fridays off, um, sort of went, went into it. Um, that said, it was actually quite successful. We got over 1,400 ideas, the first, first iteration out. Um, and we were actually quite pleased with the employee response. We realized we had to do a lot more work, though, around the review process. Because frankly, getting 1,400 plus ideas, it takes a lot of work to actually look at them, evaluate them, determine if there's merit or value to them, and have a feedback loop or a feedback process to the employees so they don't get disillusioned. So we took that. We began to implement some of the ideas. But we knew we had to do something different with the focus. We knew we had to do a lot more around uh, improving the execution loop. So what we did was we decided, OK, this was a good start. Now let's iterate it one more time. <clears throat> In 2010, um, what we did was we started off by um, establishing a, 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 a series of themes. right? So we took, uh, I think it was eight themes that we took. And these were broad themes. These are things like healthcare and what it could mean for our institution. Uh, Islamic finance, what that could mean. Um, ironically, now tax inversions was one of the things that we looked at back then and what that could mean in the future. And what we did was we organized cross-business, cross-functional teams. We had about 200 people that worked on those eight themes, so we knew to have some focused thinking around it. At the same time, we went out to about 500 of the, management, of the managers and we did some significant training with it. We gave them workshops. We gave them 
um, directions on how to encourage their staff, how to cascade, how to evaluate ideas, how to actually funnel ideas. So it's kind of interesting, um, the, the, the training that was needed around how to get the managers who are trying to incent and motivate large staff units to be able to prioritize, okay, it might be a good idea, but we simply don't have the ability to do that now. So how do we combine these? How do we get some more movement on it? Um, but at the, and at this stage, we also upped the ante on the rewards. So that year, we gave out um, about $150,000 in awards to employees for sort of well-formed ideas that had the ability to be implemented. They didn't necessarily have to be implemented at that stage, because again, we were trying to focus at that stage on the, the process, pace, and culture. So we were trying to get it grounded and embedded in the DNA of the company, or the DNA of those business units. However, the results were, were really quite strong. We had a goal that year of something around $40 million in PTI contribution, pre-tax uh, contribution from the innovation efforts. And we actually finished the year with um, just under 200% of that. So we came in around $75 million. So we actually knew at this stage, this is something that can work. This is something we're going to have to keep on iterating. This is something that can be more broadly expanded across the, the company. So at that stage, again, the journey, um, we decided to iterate it one more time. And um, what we did at that stage was, um, I actually sort of stepped away. We brought in some new folks to manage the administration of the program. Um, and we brought it company-wide at that stage. So it went from 10,000 person employee base, which was pretty complex, to a 50,000 plus employee base, covering all the business units, plus the operating units, plus technology, operating in 35 different countries. Um, so the administration became um, significantly more of a, of a challenge. We hired some folks in Hong Kong and London, as well as here in New York. And we set up that to administer the broad-based innovation program, which was really focused at that stage on what I would call incremental innovation, so sort of the smaller broad-based ideas, to some degree on working on the seams between the businesses for cross-business innovation. And then we set up a new group, which uh, Olivia, who's a colleague of mine, is here with me, and some other colleagues. Um, uh, went over to, to focus on larger scale, more transformative innovation. Um, we set up a business incubator to begin to incubate our own large scale ideas. And we also formalized the outreach effort that we had into the FinTech community and the startup community so that we could, we could begin to um, both add more value and get more value from that community. That included some uh, early stage investing activities. So, Long-winded answer to your question. It's a journey, it's been a journey, and it continues to evolve. Sure. So th thinking you know, about a smaller bank that's looking to do this, or some of the companies that are joining us today and how they would come in, are there certain frameworks that you think are just fundamental to a bank's growth trajectory? Um, so when I think about the, when I think about the frameworks, um, you sort of have to start with a vision of where you want to get to, right? What is it you want to achieve from, from the effort? And I tend to see things falling into sort of three, three buckets. There's the incremental innovation. Um, that can be, as a starting point, that can be really powerful, particularly when it comes to cost-saving ideas. Uh, operational enhancements, operational improvements, cost-saving ideas. It's also a really good way to get probably the broadest swath of your employee base engaged. So that can drive some significant economic benefit, um, you know, not, not transformational, but significant economic benefit, and is really good from an uh, employee engagement perspective. The second level um, is how do you work across the different business units. Even if you're a small bank, um, you're going to have different units focused on different parts of your business. How do you make sure that you're actually covering the seams between those businesses? 
And that requires some thought around how you fund ideas that go across multiple business units, um, how you budget for them, um, how you weave it into the strategy of the organization. And then the third area, which tends to get more of the airplay, is looking for the larger scale um, transformational areas. Um, so as again, as I think about it, first would be incremental, really engaging your employees, turning the dial a little bit. Second, cross the seams of your business. Biggest beneficiaries there are likely to be your clients uh, because you're solving new problems and new ways for your clients. And then the third is when you're looking for the transformational, whether it's in how you transform your own operations or how you extend into new spaces. So you have to start with where you want to go to and then adapt the framework that you want to use to achieve that in a sequenced fashion. Well, I think it's interesting when you're talking about these investments because it has been said that you can't save your way to profitability. So certainly there was a moment within the, the institution where you decided we have to put a little bit more skin in the game. Can you talk about how some of these ideas have been subsequently funded and why people felt so passionate about putting your money where your, you know, somebody's idea was? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good question. So from the very onset, from the very, from, from the very first day, we had firm financial targets to the businesses. So that does an amazing job of increasing focus. You know that the business is going to be measured on it. It's going to be part of the financial review. So that dramatically increases focus. We also felt that we could make the process, the program, evergreen and self-funding by taking some of those savings that you're getting. You can't save your way to prosperity, but you can, all, you can certainly save and use that to reinvest in your growth. And being able to use that as a strategy to, to drive growth. Um, there were some challenges, particularly when it came to the cross business and uh, brand new incremental uh, or brand new transformational uh, efforts. So the way we, once we'd proven the validity that we could um, impact the, the financial performance, um, what we then began to do was uh, make sure that there was funding mechanisms in place that made sure that if there was an idea, there was a way to get it that had merit, there was a way to get it funded out of cycle, there was a way to accelerate it, and that there was some funding available from the top of the house to spur that. But for the incremental and some of the other client-driven innovations, they had to be budgeted for at the, at the line of business level. Now, I turned on the TV on occasion, and I noticed that there's a certain TV show that may have inspired some of the BNY Mellon culture. So I think there's a show called Shark Tank. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And maybe you want to talk a little bit about how you incorporated that, uh, that approach? Yeah, sure. I'll. So again, to, to the point that this whole process is a journey, um, we invested in uh, innovation in a number of different ways. So um, one of the really cool ways, this was fun, was um, you know, sort of iteration three. Um, we created this contest that we called ACE. And it's, how many of you have seen Shark Tank? Okay, so you, so you, so you get the gig. What we did was we created a time-bound event. So it was an eight-week event. And there was a minimal, minimal level. So we were looking for ideas. I think initially we said they had to have a, a pre-tax contribution possibility of more than $20 million uh, by year three. I think that was the, the metric we used. What we want to do is make sure that we were looking for slightly bigger ideas. We were actually hoping for much more substantial, but thought putting out you know, $200 million bogeys would be um, a little scary to some of the employee base. So we started this contest, said, OK, there's going to be eight weeks. In the first four weeks, you submit your ideas. At the end of the four weeks, there's a quarterfinal process. We have a team of reviewers kind of go through what is, what is the most merit. Then you move into the, uh, the semifinal process. Two weeks, the semifinalists had a chance to, or the quarterfinalists had a chance to um, refine their presentations, test their assumptions. Then we held the semifinals. And these semifinals were held globally. So we had you know, regional teams in, in the different regions that we operate in globally. Um, we had cross-business teams collaborating across ideas. We ran through the semifinals, and then we set up for the last two-week sprint for the final. And for the, 
for the finalists, we took 10 teams into New York. We brought them into New York. We put our executive committee uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the judging panel role. And we had these teams come together. In some cases, these were teams that were actually collaborating remotely. They were meeting for the first time in New York to pitch their opportunity to the CEO, the president, the CFO, the most senior people in the bank. So this was tremendous exposure for these individuals, a lot of nerves. And what was wonderful about it was that at the end of that contest, there was a decision made right there at that time. Now, if you know much about decision-making processes in large banks, being able to drive a decision that quickly and being able to have it seen visibly by the entire employee base. I mean, they were logging on from all over the world from various offices to watch and to vote for and to cheer on their team. We took the contestants out. And then what really made this different was, in addition to those winners winning sub some substantial cash awards, they were also given the opportunity to leave their job, move into an incubator, and help develop and commercialize the idea. So from a process of speeding up uh, the idea generation, from the process of being able to take large-scale ideas out of the normal machinations of what the business has to do, allowing the business to focus on you know, moving the big machine as hard and as fast as they can, and then allowing the incubation to happen over here, fully with the intent of bringing it back. It was, it was, it was really wonderful. It truly sped up the, uh, uh, the time to market. Um, as you're talking about that quick decision, you, know, you have an established culture, and then you have this kind of startup mindset. How did you help bridge the gap between the two? Yeah, so cul culture is everything, right? Uh, when you've got 230 years of culture, um, it's truly everything. But you know, like I said, we, we have a culture that, you know, grounded in our history, was based on innovation. Um, so that was definitely helpful. Concurrently, the businesses that we're in, investment management and investment servicing, our clients depend upon us to be trustworthy, safe, conservative. So there is a wee bit of a clash that has to, it's not so much a clash, you have to learn how to meld those two things together. And for us, we realized that the program that we were developing, and I think this holds true for any company in any industry, you can't just take somebody else's program off the shelf and say, it's ours. You have to build something that's going to thrive and survive in the DNA of your organization. So for us, we knew that was critical. So we built a program that could, that could work within our organization. Um, that included things like creating safe zones, sandboxes to develop in, buffers and guidelines, allowing employees to know where, where to go, how to get help, where were safe zones, how you could do things that didn't disrupt your core business. And we had to do it in such a way that was right for us, right for BNY Mellon. You know, it goes back to the, your early comment about um, you know, the, the innovation journey. When I, when I went around the, uh, the company asking, you know, what does innovation mean? What should we do? I can't tell you how many times people would pull out the Google story and say, well, you know, Google lets their employees do whatever they want one day a week. We should, too. And I could just imagine how short a conversation that would have been. The 70 20 10 isn't what you wanted to bring in? No, it would have been you know, a conversation that ended with, pick a window, you're leaving. <laughs> um, so again, the important point here is um, you have to build for your own culture. You can't, just, you can't ignore your culture. You're not going to easily change your culture. The innovation programs can help evolve it, but you have to, you have to respect your culture. What's interesting as you're talking, you know, you're reminding me of a number of banks that are much smaller than yours. They may be half as old, but that still puts them well over 100. And they're at this decision point where they're saying, we need to change, we need to adapt. And our business model worked to a point, but now we have to re-examine what's possible going forward. And so they've started to insource you know, technology teams. They're trying to attract talent that they wouldn't normally look at. And I find it interesting as you're talking, because it brings the classic you know, build versus buy you know, technology dilemma you know, to, the, to the front. 
help walk us through, you know, within the innovation space, yeah. when you decide this is something you want to do on your own, and when it actually may be better to partner with a company that could do it quicker, faster, and maybe with a little bit more predictability? Well, again, it gets back to what you're trying to achieve. We were, we were looking process, pace, and culture. So if all we wanted to do was look for large-scale disruptive, we could have set up a separate lab and said, that's it. We were trying to cover the waterfront here. Um, for us with the technology journey, um, our technology organization is very large, right? We've got, I think, 13,000 technologists in the firm. We've got something like a $2 billion a year spend on technology. So clearly, anything you can do in that space is going to have a material impact. So one of the things that we have done there, actually Suresh Kumar, who's our um, CIO, has actually recently established a separate unit in Silicon Valley where we've attracted and retained a number of um, engineers to, to help work on our, on our large problems. Um, so for, again, go, going back to your question about um, outsourcing versus insourcing an innovation program, you know, there are tools you can use. There are tools you can buy to speed it up. Um, there are all sorts of idea platforms. There are many consultants out there. Um, we've used some of them. I encourage using them. But remember, it's your program. Another area that's, that's helpful is particularly where there are skill sets that you don't have resident within your firm, particularly as a smaller or mid-sized bank. You may not have that connectivity into the fintech ecosystem. You may not have that connectivity into the venture capital ecosystem. Think about who you can partner with in that space. Think about who can help you curate insights and intelligence from that space you can bring back into, into your firm. And we've actually partnered with one firm called Fintech Collective around that space, and it's worked for us. Well, and so um, you know, Fintech Collective is just one example of a, you know, a group that can look at all these emerging companies and quickly you know, make sense of who's worth even exploring further before funding that idea. You're talking about having separately a, a group set up out on the West Coast. Where are you looking for kind of the next big idea to come from? Is it a particular part of the banking cycle? Is it outside of the space? You know, it could be some of these, quote, non-bank competitors that are doing some interesting work. It's a broad question, so you can take it any way you'd like. This could take a while. <laughs> we, have um, we have some time, <laughs> though, right? Yeah. Um, so I'll try, try and sort of break, break up that question a little bit. So the first part of the question was around um, sort of how you, I'm sorry. You're doing okay. Yeah, no, it's okay. okay, sorry. Uh, it, it's sort of about how, how you decide where you're going to focus on, what the spaces are you're going to focus on, and where the next great idea is going to come from. I have no clue. Um, what I do know is that in order to, you have to be open to where the idea is going to come from, and you have to engage as broadly as you can. So that means engaging your employee base. It means co-developing with your clients. Your clients can be one of the greatest sources of inspiration and innovation, and nothing quite accelerates movement like knowing you've got a client that says, yeah, we want to do this with you, and we're willing to do this with you. So that's really, really important. And then outside of your own walls and outside of your own client base, it's how you engage with the broader ecosystem. And it's really, really important that when you're engaging with that broader ecosystem, that you have the right mindset. You're bringing to it a mindset that you have to bring value to that ecosystem. You can't just go in and take. Right? You have to be delivering value to that ecosystem. You also have to be responsive to that ecosystem and recognize and respect the differences between how a, a smaller fintech organization might, be, might behave and operate and the regular environment that we operate in as a, as a banking institution. So I don't think there's a single place you have to go. You have to engage broadly, and you have to engage differently in each space. Sure. And then be open to the ideas. Finally, sorry, I told you it was going to be long. Um, you have to have the processes inside your firm ready to act on what you discover. Well, and I think that point right there uh, kind of lines up with my question around these proverbial non-bank competitors. You and I have different ways of looking at them. You know, we were talking about Apple's product, you know, 
day tomorrow and the news that they made last week with their partnership with American Express and how that potentially accelerating their new iPhone, you know, suite of services and the financial, you know, category. And I was saying, you know, geez, shouldn't you be worried about this? And I think you talked a little bit more about it being part of the fabric of the community. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's, you know, we view the, the fintech or the non-regulated competitors as an increasing part of the fabric of the entire financial system. It's not that they're a threat, they're just part of the fabric. And we are going to work with them, we choose to work with them. They are doing some fascinating work in, in a number of different sleeves. Um, you know, one sleeve that I think is, is really interesting is in what the, what's happening in the lending space. So whether it's the peer-to-peer -peer lending space or whether it's in some of the small business uh, uh, lending firms that are bringing algorithms and new technology to bear on rapidly analyzing um, loan requests and making uh, rapid credit decisions. I think that's a, a, an interesting space and there's a space for, there's, that's a space that uh, these fintech companies are, are leading the charge in. Another space that I think is particularly interesting is around uh, aggregation and analytics technology. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting work in the, in the fintech space going on, particularly around the aggregation, organization, and analysis of asset data, particularly in the high net worth and the ultra high net worth market. There's some firms doing some really interesting work there. And sort of as a corollary to that, on the analysis side, there are firms like um, Kensho, Clear Story, or Discern that are doing some really interesting work on speeding up and bringing new technologies and new models to bear on the investment analysis process. The last place that I go to is the whole investment and advice space, which gets a lot of attention as well. And in the investment advice space, there's some incredibly innovative work being done um, by a number of brokerage firms that are bringing social elements and gamification elements to the investing process or making it easier for consumers to invest thematically. And then finally, of course, the, the robo-advisors who they're, they're, they're getting a lot of attention, raising a lot of money, and they're all focused on this niche of with variation, but focus basically on this niche of low-cost asset allocation strategies. They're all part of the financial services fabric. We're going to work with them. They're non-banks. They're working in their sleeve. We're a bank. We'll be working with them. Yeah. I know you may have intentionally overlooked some of the payment uh, folks. You know, PayPal is doing a lot that's generating a lot of concern throughout the financial sector. But you know, personally, I find their Achilles heel at the moment is they can't help you make a smart spending decision. I look at some of these fintech companies that are out there that are really helping to visualize what you can spend, where you should spend, when, why, and how. I'm curious if you've looked at any of those organizations. Well, yeah, in, in terms of those uh, organizations that are focused on um, either goal-based savings is, is a good example of that, um, or um, maximizing or optimizing savings decisions. You know, we think that's interesting from a consumer perspective. For us as an institution, we're not a consumer bank. We serve uh, institutions, sovereign nations, um, uh, ultra high net worth and high net worth individuals. So a lot of those consumer technologies from a business perspective for BNY Mellon are not front of mind. However, we do keep an eye on the space. Um, you know, I think with the whole payments space, you know, there will be non-bank competitors in that space. Um, you still have to have the bank holding the money. You need to have that FDIC-insured uh, partner, either as a partner, or you'll have the FDIC-insured firm actually innovating themselves. Ultimately, the decision's going to lie in the hands of the consumer. The consumer wants what they want. They want the best choice of their... Uh, they want the best user experience. They want the easiest user experience. They want to integrate these behaviors into their daily life in the way that they want to do it. So regardless of whether you're a bank or a non-bank competitor, the winners will be those firms that can provide the best choice, the best experience, and the best set of financial products that the consumer wants. So if you know, some of the companies that are here you know, could say, well, I do that, like, how would they take their story into an organization like yours, or maybe not just the BNY Mellons, but you look at some of these big banks that seem 
Like they have a, a clear set way of doing things and maybe they've built their walls up a little higher than maybe they should have. Well, if you fit in that category, please do come before seeing anybody else come to see us. That would be, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, that being said, you have, to, you have to understand, it's very important to understand um, the, the type of company you're dealing with, right? And it's very important to understand the scope and scale of the problems that you're trying to solve from every perspective. Um, so the first thing I would say is understand exactly what it is you're trying to solve for and understand it from everybody's perspective. All too often we see um, companies, startup companies, that have a technology that they think is the answer when in fact the problem is a market structure problem. So you need to understand the problems you're trying to solve from every perspective. Second thing that's sort of important to understand is when you're dealing with a large regulated uh, entity, the processes that we've set up, the process that are established, the process of communication, coordination, decision making, they're really not designed to be flexible. So you have to understand that as you engage with a large company like, our, like ours. And then the third thing I'd say is that um, security and reputation are of paramount importance. So if you think about those things in how you engage with a large company, um, it, it will help shape it. Um, then try and find somebody who can be your guide, and ideally try and find somebody who can be your guide across the entire enterprise as opposed to simply in one single business unit. I'm going to ask you to take a step out of your current role and just maybe put on one of those consulting hats for a second because you think about the banking world we live in today. And 20 years ago, there were more than 15,000 banks doing business in the United States alone. And that number currently is under 6,800. And so that consolidation is unbelievable in just any type of you know, historical uh, time frame. That said, there's still this appetite you know, for banks to either get a lot more efficient, to expand the size of their franchise, to stand out, to differentiate, but they're really not sure how to save their way to that or to become more efficient than they already have been. If you look at the pressures that they're under, you know, they're just mounting. So if you're putting your consulting hat on, you're coming into a bank, and let's make them a public bank you know, on an exchange like this one. Maybe they're you know, five, six, seven billion dollars in assets. They came out of the crisis, they're healthy, they have an aspiration to grow, but they're really not sure you know, on the technology end where they should be expanding from their classic model. What type of ideas would you give them for the future? Well, that's a tough question. Um, so I think that firstly, um, I would encourage them to spend some time thinking about sort of some of the macro trends that are impacting their business, not just now, but where those trends are, are going to. And begin to think about a strategy to fit yourself into those expansion curves. Because you can look out and you can see what's occurring in terms of the macro themes and how they're impacting financial services. Then you have to develop a point of view. As a CEO or the, the senior management, you have to develop a point of view of where you think you want to be able to be under those curves and how you position your assets, either your current assets or the assets you're going to need to have for that. And from that, you can begin to develop a plan of attack. You won't necessarily know. I mean, the, the trap you fall into is it's going to be this particular thing. Instead, if you think about it more as, you know, where, where's the market going? Where do I want to be sitting? What assets do I need to have? What assets do I currently have? What do I need to build upon? And how can I get those most effectively? Is it through building? Is it through partnering? Is it through acquisition? Um, is it through doing some spread betting by taking a number of smaller uh, firms and pulling them together? And make sure that it fits into your strategy of where you want to be out here as opposed to looking for that one sort of golden butt. So you wouldn't say that just going all in on the mobile banking you know, craze would be an appropriate approach. I mean, if you look at some of the, the current literature, it seems like everyone's pushing this drive you know, mobile because that's where your consumer base is or your customer base would be. You know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far to say it, it's not appropriate. It may be appropriate for some institutions. Um, you know, that's, that's clearly a 
you know, a trend that exists right now is only going to continue to grow. Um, and you know, the, the advances in mobile banking just, just are happening every single day. If you decide that's the space you want to play in, then you have to decide how you want to play in that. And some of the obvious ways are, you know, you can be the partner that helps enable, if you have the bank license, you can be the partner that helps enable a lot of these competitors. If you decide it's the space you want to go after yourself, how are you going to make sure that you have the type of technology, that you have the type of market presence, that you have the, um, the, the market recognition, that you have the market permissions and to go after that space? You make the decision about where you want to play, then you decide how you're going to play it. So I think it's for every, for every company, it's how they want to play it. Ultimately, I think, personal opinion, it's only a personal opinion, um, that you know, the, the, goes back to my earlier comment about um, there are a lot of really smart companies taking slivers of the value stream. Ultimately, the consumer will make the decision. It has to be the easiest experience for them with the right selection of financial products that they need at the price points they want. And so if I put you back in your current role, and you're talking about these companies that have a sliver and you find them interesting, how do you decide that you want to acquire that fintech company as opposed to just you know, working with them? Well, we do very few acquisitions um, in, in this space. We, we have done some, uh, but we do very few. Our chosen, our preferable model right now is instead to partner. Uh, that may mean making a minority investment uh, in, in the company. If it has a, uh, a strategic approach or if it's got a technology or a business model that we think can be interesting and help inform our businesses and grow our businesses. You know, again, we're a very large institution, so very small acquisitions don't necessarily make a lot of sense from a strategic perspective. Um, and and so that's, not our, that's not our preferred model right now. Um, instead, we prefer to partner with firms. And earlier you talked about you know, there's that big transformative you know, opportunity that doesn't come along that often. You know, if you were to see something like that, would that be the most attractive thing for you to look at in that buy versus you know, partner space? Yeah, again, it becomes you know, what, what's, what's the thing you're trying to achieve? What's the result you're trying to achieve? What's the job that has to get done? And how do you get that job done most effectively? Is it through owning the asset? Is it through partnering with uh, another provider of it? You have to decide what the job is that, that has to be done first. And then from that, you can determine what the best uh, approach is. Well, I feel like I'm asking a lot of the questions. I'm curious as I listen to a little bit of murmuring in the back, if there's things that are on people's minds that we've talked about or maybe we've overlooked the topic, maybe you want us to go a little bit deeper on something. This would be an opportunity if anybody has some questions for Declan to raise their hand. Hi, Declan. <laughs> hi, hi, Declan. Paul Doyle, Verify Valid. Um, I'm torn between asking one of two questions. The I guess the first is in terms of un wide, and, and if that might not pose an area where we're going to see some interesting things happen, and what's BNY Mellon's perspective on that? So, great question. Um, so, you know, again, the, the unbanked uh, opportunity is huge, and I think what's going to drive um, the financial access will be the growth in mobile banking, particularly in emerging markets. So that's a trend that we're clearly seeing. It's a, it's a trend that continues to grow and has got huge implications and ramifications for, for, for individuals across the world. We think it's a really interesting, fascinating space. Um, in terms of our role in, in that space, again, we tend to be an institutional focused bank. So what we may actually do is provide services to other banks that are serving that end, to you, that end user. Uh, but we're not directly going after that uh, unbanked end user. Well, do you have a follow-up question? You've got a look on your face like you might. I'm right here. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the, the reason I had asked is you mentioned that um, sovereign nations are among the, or, or um, public 
state entities are among the population that you serve as customers. And if we think about a global market, uh, to me it would seem that you're in a position to in fact make the market for banking and banking and financial services more global instead of um, being fractured as it is I think today. That's the reason for that question and where you guys are on that. Helping countries, not at the, at the uh, consumer level, but actually helping countries deal with some of these issues of opening up our markets and opening up the flow of capital. That's a really good question. So we, uh, the, the types of services that we're providing to governments are particularly around the investment servicing and the investment management side. Uh, that being said, we continuously have dialogue where we think we can add value uh, to our clients in whatever aspect they want to do. Uh, we recently actually have done, we, we've recently introduced um, a new uh, central securities depository uh, in Europe to help speed up some of the flows of funds, again, more on an institutional level than on the retail level. It's an area that I find our role being an enabler rather than a direct consumer, just because of where we operate currently in the marketplace. Yeah, one up in the front. Hi, Declan. Jim Neavy, SunGuard Financial Systems. Uh, as you're thinking about innovation for the purposes of growth, particularly over the last few years, uh, the regulators have been imposing more in the form of standards across the way that all the banks need to do things. So as that continues to happen, what, if at all in any way, have, do you think about the, the possibility of utilities being created either where one bank serves multiple for standard processes or a financial technology provider comes in and provides a service that crosses over all the banks in the form of a utility to, to meet those standards while you're focused on the more strategic items? Jim, that's a, that's a great question. And you're right, there's, since the, what we'd call the global reset that occurred, um, there has been increased focus on how can you take cost out of um, things that don't differentiate you in the marketplace. Uh, so that gets to your, your, your utility question. It's an area that we've spent a lot of time on, and uh, we actually think that that is going to be something that you're going to see more and more of. And we're actively participating in some of those efforts. Uh, there is one, um, one effort underway right now that's uh, a client reference data utility that we are a partner in, uh, where there is a, an industry operator, DTCC, will be actually be operating the entity. Um, but we partnered with a number of other uh, banks to help bring in the client reference data to help take an, an expense out of the process and also to enhance the process, improve the process. So we, act, we absolutely think that there's space for that and I think that we will selectively participate in or try to be part of that, uh, that solution as markets continue to evolve. It's a great question. David Wallace with SAS. I'm interested in understanding how the innovation group works with technology inside BNY Mellon to try and, I guess, encourage, enable, facilitate new types of technologies coming in and also how it works um, in partnership with the existing technologies that you already use. Is there a partnership between technology and innovation or is it one and the same at BNY? Another great question. So um, it's largely one and the same, right? Anything you do is likely to have a technology implication, right? So, so technology is going to be involved somewhere. Now, some of the biggest problems that the technologists may be, may be focused on may be around how we improve our performance or operating performances, while on the innovation side, we may be more out into what's the new space. But inevitably, we come together. And our CIO, Suresh Kumar, is a big believer in this. Uh, as I think I mentioned, he's opened his own uh, facility right now. Um, so, or it was not, not his own facility, but a new facility for us um, uh, in, in Silicon Valley. So uh, for us, they're, they're woven together. Technology is virtually always going to be part of whatever we're trying to do. So you have to be hand in hand. 
I think we might have time for one last question if anyone wants to challenge <laughs> Declan as I feel like you're getting right now. <laughs> hey, Jonathan Hunter, CDW. Um, I'll, I'll, as he would as say, I'll have, have you put your consulting hat on, I guess. So if you look at banks that are not in the BNY Mellon um, market, right, the smaller $5, $10 billion asset banks, and they're trying to evaluate how do we move towards an OPEX model versus a CAPEX model for technology expenditures, research, how do we leverage what's out there? Do you see the cloud being even relevant in this financial space or just kind of a fad that's eventually they'll move away from, from security implications and just risk that they don't even want to associate with uh, as a smaller bank? As a, you're, as a consultant, of course. Yeah, that, that's, that's totally a consulting question. Um, Look, I think that because of the performance and expense benefits of the cloud, there will inevitably be movement towards the cloud. The big concern is always security. That's going to always be the number one uh, challenge. It doesn't have to be public cloud. You can have private cloud as well and get a lot of the incremental benefit. I don't think that the, I, I, I think that cloud is part of where we are. It's going to be part of how we deliver services. Um, right now we do operate a private cloud. For a smaller bank, they're going to have to make the decisions on whether they can afford to do their own private cloud or whether they want to go outside. But I think that security is always going to be of paramount importance. Has to be. Well, to everyone who joined us online, we really appreciate you taking the time. Everyone who came to New York today, certainly uh, we hope you've enjoyed this part of FinTech Day. We invite you to stick around. Have some snacks and refreshments with us. We'll be doing the closing bell ceremony in about an hour, and we obviously will welcome all of your participation for that. But if we could, let's thank Declan for sharing his thoughts. Thank you. So as I said, you know, we do have refreshments for everyone right now. Um, I think these lights are going to go off, and there are going to be other ones that come on in a few minutes. So you know, again, coffee, juice, water, maybe even some... Stronger than that, I think, is being made available. Again, thanks to our friends at the NASDAQ. <laughs>